Hi, welcome to This Is Reviewable. Today, we're going to review things, and it's the month of love. So we watched a love movie, and we're going to talk about that right now. What love movie did we watch? This week, we watched You've Got Mail with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. Yeah, what's it about? You didn't write a synopsis? I don't got no prepared statement today. Oh my gosh. This what? ain't no game, Micah. Uh, struggling boutique bookseller Kathleen Kelly, who's Meg Ryan, hates Joe Fox, who's Tom Hanks, the owner of a corporate Fox Books chain, basically Barnes & Noble, mm -hmm. chain store that just moved in across the street. When they meet online, they begin an intense and anonymous internet romance, oblivious of each other's true identity. Eventually, Joe learns that the enchanting woman he's Joe learns that the enchanting woman he's involved with is actually his business rival. He must now struggle to reconcile his real life dislike for her with the cyber love he's come to feel. The cyber love he he's come to feel. That's what it says. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. Well, that's what it is, and it's uh you know during the dial up internet era so aol yeah they, they AAO, just yeah aol they just meet in a chat room and chat all the time chat 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 yeah um so we we kind of watched this in two parts because we started it and then at some point michael was like this isn't very good <laughs> and we stopped watching it that day and i was like i don't know i don't mind it and Which then, is not normal for it to be this way for us. Normally it's Brayden not liking things and I'm saying it's fine. Yeah. Um, and then we finished it the next day. But I think, uh, well, do you have any likes that you want to get off your chest? So usually... It's really embarrassing to have likes for a movie, but <laughs> you have to admit them here. This is a place of truth. So the way that I write down notes during a movie is I just do bullet points of likes, dislikes, confused slashed things to mention mm -hmm. i didn't put any likes oh <laughs> i didn't like anything there's not very many notes that i have about this movie it's just not very memorable that's exactly what i was gonna say like so this is in the early 90s probably yeah i of, guess well i can look this uh, up uh, here, actually you have it yeah it it's got to be in the 90s 98. Yeah. Okay. okay. And this is, you know, the time of Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, who did You've Got Mail, Sleepless in Seattle. Mm -hmm. I feel like they did another one, but I haven't seen Sleepless in Seattle in a while. Both of them are completely ridiculous, storyline-wise, but Sleepless in Seattle is better, in my opinion. What was ridiculous about this storyline? It's just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Why was it stupid? Well, I'll get it. Can we start with dislikes then? Uh, wait, let me try and rack my brain for something to like. Let's just start with dislikes. All right, fine. Okay, so Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks are both in relationships with other people. It seems like they either are kind of serious or they've been dating for a decent amount of time because I think Tom Hanks lives with his girlfriend and Meg Ryan basically lives with her boyfriend. At some point, Meg Ryan and her boyfriend break up mm -hmm. and it's like the most passive, easy breakup ever. Yeah, it's like the, the Seinfeld episode where he realizes that everything always evens out for him. Yeah. Yeah, and the girl breaks up with him and he's like, that's okay. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. We'll both meet someone else. I really enjoyed dating you and uh, good luck. Yeah. And it's just like, what did he say? He he met someone else and she's like, I'm so happy for you uh -huh. and I'm going to be okay. And like, we're just friends and all. I just don't believe that. Why? Even though it like hurts your feelings when you get your, when you get broken up. They were probably, I mean, I don't know. They were both just not right for each other. I agree, but like. And tired. They're both tired of each other, too. And I feel like that can happen for sure. Yeah. 
I just feel like it was so blasé. Yeah. Do you like that word? That's, yeah. That's, <laughs> wow. <laughs> nice job. Thanks. Didn't realize I was dealing with a French woman. <laughs> wee wee. Um, something else I didn't like. So Meg Ryan has like this little boutique. Her name is Megathon. Oh my bad. Yeah. Her name Megaton, is Meg- Megatron, actually. No, Megatron, Riotron. Just Megatron Ryan. No. Yeah. Uh, look it up. That's her real name. <laughs> um, she, and I just feel like, okay. She owns this little tiny bookstore where, like, their charm is that everyone that works there loves books and knows a ton about books and mm-hmm. is, like, just has a true love for it. Right. And she hates the Fox books, whatever, for being some great monopoly of books. And yeah, these. and it's soulless or whatever. But then she goes to Starbucks every single day. Does she? Every <laughs> single day. Yeah. How is that any different? It's not different at all. It's the exact same yeah. thing. It's so the, it is, yeah. That was one of my dislikes. Okay, so she's hypocritical. Yes. Because she can she can appreciate her own little microcosm of the world, but... Beyond that, it doesn't matter. Exactly. Yeah. All right. And, you know, if she's going to, like, if she's going to be a flawed character, have her be more flawed than that. Like, how, like, I just don't think it's very realistic that her and her boyfriend would break up that way. Hmm. I don't know. What did, so what don't you like? Honestly, I don't hate this movie. I meant what I said when I was like, it's all right. Um... I just think it's very safe paint by the numbers. Neither of them are allowed to say or do anything that, you know, might make them look bad. It's just boring. Meg and Tom. Yeah. The, the, Our the good ca- friends. Meg and Tom. Yeah. Um, it's like, so I was trying to think after we finished it, I was like, I didn't mind it, but I never want to watch it again. And I was trying to think of, what I like about romantic comedies that I like. And so I came up with a couple of ideas that are half baked, the best kind of ideas and half baked ideas are the best kind of ideas. Right. No. Yeah. The only half baked thing that's the best is the ice cream. A pizookie. Okay. Fine. Yep. See, um, anyway, so I like a, an example of a rom com that I really like is Silver Linings Playbook, and I was thinking about what I liked about that movie, and I I really liked the humor, um, and and the way that Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence play off of each other. It felt like like their humor, like the the dialogue was written very sharply, and it was really funny. And absurd things would happen, but they felt like real people. Felt like a real scenario that could happen, right? And then Robert De Niro's character also, like, I just find that movie really funny. There's nothing really that funny in this movie at all. There's, like, one joke that I remember, and it was um, Dave Chappelle's in this movie, by the way. It's so random. Yeah, as, as the, like, assistant to Tom Hanks' character. And, like... This is the only joke I remember in the whole movie. Like, eventually they are going to meet each other in a cafe. They, in, you know, they t- say in the Tom chat room. Tom and Meg. Yeah, Tom and Meg. Let's, let's meet up in a cafe. Meg Ryan gets there first. They're cyber people. They're in the chat. They say that they're. Yeah, I know. That. I, yeah, I said you that. You said that. Okay. Um, and so they're going to meet up in real life. And Tom Hanks brings Dave Chappelle with him because he's really nervous. And he's like, can you just look in there and tell me what she looks like? And by this point, him and um, Meg Ryan are already feuding. And he's like, huh, how do you feel about Kathleen Kelly? It's Kathleen Kelly. I don't like her. Who cares about her? Well, if you don't like Kathleen Kelly, I can guarantee you're not going to like this woman. <laughs> like, what? Why? Because she is Kathleen Kelly. <laughs> and like, I think the reason I thought it was so funny is like he's delivering it as if it's a stand-up routine. Yeah, I know, yeah. And so, like, I was like, oh, yeah, that's the Dave Chappelle I know. And that's the only joke I can remember from the whole movie. And Dave Chappelle maybe gets, like, ten minutes of screen time. Total. 
Yeah. Yeah. This movie's just not funny at all. Yeah. And, like, they had this weird thing. So the way Joe Fox, Tom Hanks, so he's the grandson that seems to be having, being in charge of a lot of Fox books. There's his dad and his granddad. Uh-huh. Who both have young kids. I thought it was just the dad. Nope. It was the granddad. Yep. Because. Oh, right. Yeah. Because Joe Fox has an aunt who's 10. And then he has a brother who's five. Yeah. And it's just weird. Like, why did. For what purpose? Because yeah. the kids aren't. Like, in the beginning of the movie, they're more involved just to show that, like. Joe Fox is a real human being. And he's like, a good guy. And he's a good guy. And he likes his brother and his niece. And then, his ki- yeah. And then, kind of once they show that, they never see you. Never see the kids anymore. Yeah. Um, it's just like this movie. It takes no risks at all, and it's just not memorable. I'll never want to watch it again. But I don't hate it. It's very milk toast, vanilla pudding middle of the road whatever it's a big nothing burger i feel like that's just how i feel about it like i don't have anything really negative i mean that is a pretty negative thing that i just said but there's nothing i hated about it it's just it's just not really worth your time i would say um oh yeah we forgot we have been forgetting to do parental guide but i mean this is it might be pg pg yeah there it's might very... be a couple of jokes here and there that might make it PG-13, but I don't think there's any language. Yeah. It's there's no tame. sex. Again, like, very tame, very safe. Yeah. Very paint-by-the-numbers. Um, so, you want to rate it? Um, there was one other thing that I wanted to say. The intro to this movie. Oh, yeah. It was Forgot like a computer-animated... Or... So, I took a intro to computer animation class in high school and the intro looked like something that i could have figured out and done in high school but to be fair like that was in 1998 so i'm sure it would have been a lot harder to get that yeah it's just funny because you know that when someone came up with this idea they were like oh hell yeah this is revolutionary this is people are gonna remember this and like the only thing i remember is that is rough it's it's aged about as well as milk yeah yeah so anyway you want to rate it yeah i'll rate this uh a four and a half brinkley's out of ten okay i'm gonna give it a five misplaced dave Chappelle's out of ten okay Mm mm-hmm um, should we talk about Argyle? Oh, are we doing that? I think we should save that, right? Oh, oh, right. Yeah, we're doing double feature. Okay. Uh, dang, I wasn't ready for this, but yeah, we watched Argyle. And it was, I'm kind of sad. I don't want to ruin our review. It was kind of, every time I looked over, we went and watched this recently, and every time I looked over, Brayden was smiling and laughing. And then we got out of the movie theater, and I was like, that was great! And Brendan was like, eh. I was just like, F- that movie. <laughs> we went with a friend. Brendan, you're going to have to bleep that. Yeah, I know. Um, we went with a friend also, and he wasn't a huge fan of it either. Which was too bad. So Micah was kind of the only one that liked it a lot, but what's it about? So, a quick um, synopsis of it. Um, it's about this author... Ellie Conway, who writes best-selling espionage novels about a secret agent named Argyle, who's on a mission to unravel a global spy syndicate. However, when the plots of her book start to mirror the covert actions of a real-life spy organization, the line between fiction and reality begin to blur. Yeah. So, okay, disclaimer. This is apparently something that's tricked a lot of people. If you've seen the trailers for this movie or the poster for this movie, you may think that Henry Cavill is the star of the of the movie. He's not. He's the character. He's Argyle. He's very much so a supporting yeah. side 
character. Not even support. He's a side character. Yeah. And just so this doesn't happen again, next time you watch a trailer, make sure you're paying attention to what's happening in the trailer. Because it is, I feel like, pretty clear that he's the character from the trailer. Like, he's he's Argyle, and she's writing a book called Argyle. So he's not, you know, he's the character. He's not the one in real life. Sam Rockwell is the one in real life. Yeah. So the movie starts off with Ellie Conway at, like, a book signing, book reading something. She decides to go and visit her mom. And so she takes the train because apparently she has a huge fear of flying. And on the train, she meets Sam Rockwell, whose character's name is... Oh... Something like Clint... Or Scott. Aiden. (laughs) Clint? Yeah, it was close. Aiden. (laughs) Um, So she meets Aiden, and he's almost immediately, he's like, I'm a spy. Yeah. Or whatever. Just whatever. But he he delivers it well. He does. That's one thing I'll say for this movie is Sam Rockwell is always good in everything he's in. Yeah. Even in a movie that I don't like, I like him in it. But a la this movie, a la Iron Man 2. He's always good in whatever yeah. he's in. He's one of those characters, those actors that I just completely forget about, who is amazing. And every single time he's in a movie, yeah. and I watch it, I'm like, why do I not remember you? He did such a good job in this movie. Yeah. Um. So on the train, she meets Sam Rockwell, who's Aiden. And Aiden almost immediately is like, I'm a spy. And then starts getting to, starts getting into these fights with all these other people that are trying to hurt Ellie on the train on the train. Yeah. And this is something that I actually really liked was this fight scene yeah. because Ellie Argyle is kind of like her imaginary friend, quote unquote, where yeah. she'll talk to him and like, she'll see him, but like no one else can see him. Yeah. And so Aiden is having these fights with all these different bad guys and she keeps blinking and it's Henry Cavill. And then she'll blink again, and then it's Sam Rockwell. And, then, and it just keeps going. And I felt like the transition of Henry Cavill and Sam Rockwell was really good. Yeah. And it was just like a fun fight. Yeah, I liked that fight scene. Where at some point she's in the bathroom, and the door closes, and then opens again. And he's fighting these two women, and the door closes and opens again. And they're like, this isn't exactly yeah. what happens. But like giving him a wedgie or something. Not exactly that. And then like door closes and opens. Or a swirly. Something. And, and then shoots him in the head. No. And then he has them both in, like, a headlock, one of each arm. Yeah. It was just, it was a fun fight. Yeah. Um, there there were definitely moments in this movie where I was like, okay, I like this. And then it would just meander, or it would twist, and I was like, oh, never mind, I don't like this anymore. And then another scene like that fight scene would happen, and I'd be like, okay, I like this again. It's just very, like, back and forth. Mm. Snip, snap, snip, snap. I did, like... At the beginning, I think I was kind of annoyed by it. And then I just remembered, or this is how I framed my thinking for the whole movie. And once I thought this, I really liked the movie a lot more. That Ellie Conway is a writer, and Mm -hmm. she writes these novels that assumedly are really good. Because a lot of people buy them. But I just thought of this movie as though someone was telling like a romance, like a, a book. And like there's things that are crazy and like absurd Mm -hmm. but like in books it's okay a lot of times because it's just for fun and so i just thought of this book as like not taking itself too seriously and for fun Mm -hmm. and then i like definitely not taking itself seriously yeah but it's definitely a parody yeah like uh okay so a little bit of background the director for this movie his name is matthew vaughn and he's done a lot of movies but one of his, probably his most famous is Kingsman, mm-hmm. the Kingsman series. And this is in the same vein as that because it's, you know, a spy movie. He likes to make fun of a lot of the tropes of spy movies. He likes to crank things up to 11 and make it ridiculous. And he's doing that here um, the same as, well, similar to how he does in Kingsman. So that's just a little bit of background. Background. Um, are you? Do you still have more positives to talk about? Um, the 
character that they have for Ellie is kind of annoying at first, uh-huh. but she honestly kind of grew on me, and I liked her. The actress, you mean? No. Oh, you're saying the way the character's written? Yeah. Okay. At first, kind of bugged me, but I liked her a lot more as the movie went on. Okay. Um. See, yeah, I think I was actually the opposite. Really? You liked yeah. her at first and then didn't? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It started... This movie takes a lot of twists and turns. I thought it was fun, though. I At a certain point, I'm, like, all twisted out, and I'd like it to just, you know, play out. But anyway, that's just a disagreement we have about that. Hmm. There's one part at the end of the movie that's so ridiculous. Yeah. But it was so funny. That, it was like, pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, like, how could you be upset yeah. at it? I feel like. it it's like, again... I'll, Kingsman, like the way that they fight in Kingsman is like very, like they. It's so hard to describe. I'll, I'll just have to show you a clip from the movie. Maybe I'll put one in this video, one that's not rated R. <laughs> um, but like, it's very stylized, and that's how this is too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's also a part right before the part you're talking about where there's a whole bunch of colors going on. I was. No, that was after. I thought. No, that was before. Yeah. Um, I liked that part a lot. I thought that part was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard people complain about that part. They're like, I couldn't see anything. I was like, yeah, but it's also like, so basically kind of funny. They're in a hallway and they're throwing smoke grenades, smoke grenades, but all of them are different colors. So it's just like, and they're like dancing and like there's music, but they're also fighting. They're shooting as they dance. Yeah. It's just like the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen. It's pretty funny. Like just I liked that. I for liked that, that scene and the fight scene right after that and the first fight scene, this movie's worth seeing, I feel like. Uh, I don't know. In my that. opinion. I, I think you should wait until you can get those clips on YouTube and then just. Really? Yeah. I think that's like, can we get to dislikes now? Yeah. I think this movie's way too freaking long. Oh really? I it just so. it just me like it meanders and it just it's too long. It's like two and a half hours. And no way. Yes. Oh. This should have been like a one and a half hour movie, maybe two hours, but like it felt long to me. Um, a dislike I had was <sighs> this is gonna sound mean. Cat people are annoying. Hmm. cat people are annoying because she's like a psycho cat lady and like totally obsessed with her cats and like we have cats we're cat people in a way but But, we're not like that no like she she should have left her freaking cat at home yeah for one yeah and for two i love my cats to death but if i had to choose between what me and them yeah, you'd I'd leave yourself. them behind, yeah. you know, and she's like completely risking her life and being complete and risking the lives of people around her for this cat, which I don't think is fair. What else didn't you like? I mean, I've brought up Kingsman a lot. Um, I think part of the reason that that worked, like I like that movie so much is a it's a little simpler. Mm-hmm. It's not trying to be like a mystery at the same time as it's a spy thriller. Yeah. Which this movie is definitely trying to do. Um, so Kingsman just feels a lot more streamlined and a lot more focused. Um, but I think that the fact that Kingsman is rated R and Matthew Vaughn was able to just kind of let loose and like make it really violent and make it, you know, vulgar and like people swearing at each other i found like that to be a much better fit for this sort of goofy ridiculous Mm -hmm. um because this movie there's some parts like where matthew vaughn wants the characters to do really violent things but they show no blood there's no swearing and it just feels like something's missing Mm -hmm. and like that's not usually a criticism i'm gonna have of a movie but in this case, it felt like Matthew Vaughn would have preferred this to be rated R. But maybe the studio was like, eh, no, we, we want to make it PG-13 so we can sell it to more people. That's how I kind of felt about it. Yeah. I also felt like where they put the F word in this movie was so stupid. Yeah, there's one F word. And, like, they just wasted it. 
It was like, I remember thinking it didn't bring any, like, it wasn't funny. It wasn't impactful. If anything, it took away from the moment, in my opinion. Hey, you want to know what's weird? I just thought of Hmm. Samuel L. Jackson is in this movie and he doesn't get the one F word. Yeah. It's so sad. Yeah. That's kind of, okay. Anyway. I'm trying to find that stupid, the name of that stupid dance move. What dance move? The triple axel. Not that. The twist. The thing where they lift him up and spin. Dirty dancing. Do you not know what I'm talking about? I don't. I'm not going to get that. Samuel L. Jackson did a good job in this movie. Yeah. You don't think so? Hmm. I don't know. He was just like, it's like the kind of role that he can sleepwalk through. Yeah, that's fair. It's like not asking anything of him. He's also in the first Kingsman. And he's hilarious in the first Kingsman because he's the villain and he's like a, like a super tech genius and he talks with a lisp. Like, have you ever heard Samuel L. Jackson talk with a lisp? No. It's really entertaining. Um, I just think that this movie, I was comparing this those two movies a lot because there are a lot of similarities and it feels like he's trying to capture the lightning in a bottle a second time, but in a PG-13 version. And it just doesn't work nearly as well oh i'll you know what um i'm saying this now so i'll remember to talk about it after we rate it but there's a little spoilery thing that i want to talk about too is there anything else we wanted to talk about no i don't think so do you have anything else what's your rating i put this as after we watched this movie i took notes and stuff and I wrote down my rating, and then I was trying to remember the name of the specific dance move that they have in the movie, and they show it periodically throughout the movie, and they call it a specific thing. And that's what I wanted to rate this. Uh, but I haven't, I've literally been searching this whole time that you've been talking. Yeah. Trying to find it. And I can't find it. But I rate this an 8.5, 8.75. I really liked this movie. I thought it was really fun as a first watch. I don't know if I'll ever watch it again, but I really liked this movie. And I'm going to do 8.75 triple axles. Okay. What do you rate this? I'm going to give it six. Kill that motherfucker. He killed all our friends. Kill that motherfucker. He killed all our friends. (laughs) Out of 10. (laughs) Um, Okay. Spoiler time. Yeah, so up ahead, spoilers. Yeah. If you don't want to hear the spoilers, skip ahead. So this is just this is really the one thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, yeah, you know what? Yeah, the one thing I wanted to talk about. So there's a post-credit scene, kind of like in the middle of the credits, so I guess a mid-credit scene, where... So you find out that Argyle is, um, is not really a character. It's Her. Elle's, Ellie's past life. She was an agent, something happened, she lost her memory, and Argyle is like her past self speaking to her. So that's one of the twists in this movie. She's an actual secret agent. So Argyle doesn't exist. But then at the end of the movie, she's doing a book signing and Henry Cavill in real life is in the crowd and he has like a, you know, some kind of Southern accent or whatever and crazy hair. So like- He's kind of like a Southern hick. It's sort of like an, is it, is Argyle actually fake or is he a real agent? And is that him back there? In the mid credit scene, they cut to this tavern and the ta- in England and the tavern is called the Kingsman. And a young Argyle is in the tavern having some kind of meetup with somebody. So like at a certain point, I felt a little unfair comparing this to Kingsman, but it seems like maybe he's insinuating that they take place in the same universe maybe there's going to be a crossover at some point like that's how that's how many similarities those two movies have so i feel like it is pretty fair to compare them especially since it's the same director since maybe they're happening in the same universe Hmm. but anyway that was all i wanted to talk about so i read this book it's called lovely war by julie berry and this book starts off with this couple 
who can't keep their hands off of each other sneaking into this hotel and they get a room together. And long story short, the couple is Aphrodite and Ares. Mm. They're going to hook up. And Hephaestus, who is Aphrodite's husband, yeah. shows up and Puts basically... Puts the net on them. Yeah. Have you, do you know this? This is a story from mythology. Oh, okay. Puts a net on them and basically starts to like hold a trial for her... Um, infidelity. Yeah, infidelity. And Aphrodite starts telling this story about her favorite... Um, her favorite love stories. Uh huh. Um, and so the book is about and one of them is "You've Got Mail." Yeah. No. It's not worth mentioning. Don't ever talk <laughs> about that again to me. Um, Sheesh! I really hated that movie. <laughs> but it's during the story that she's telling is set during World War One, and it's about. It starts off about this girl, um, Hazel, who's like 18, 17, 18. And she's at this dance where I think the church put it on. The church? The church in her area. Okay. Her church. Okay. That she attends. um, Sponsored this dance where soldiers that are either going or home can come and just have a good time with and dance with girls, basically. When she's there, she meets this guy, James, and they really hit it off. And they're both kind of just young and inexperienced and, like, really awkward and cute, whatever. So they start hanging out for the next couple of days because in five days after they met, he's getting shipped off to the war. And they really like each other, and it's very obvious that they like each other. But like I said, they're inexperienced and all that. So at some point, like, day two or something like that of them hanging out, Hazel's like, what the heck? Like, how come you haven't kissed me? And he's like, let's kiss right before I leave. Uh Like, meet me at the train station and all that. And so he ends up getting shipped off early and they start writing each other. And so the story goes on to tell their love story through them writing each other, but also his experience on the front lines and also her experience... Um, of staying back at home and she ends up um, volunteering for the YMCA. She's in France and she meets this girl Colette who's Dutch, I think. And Colette ends up meeting an African American who is like a part of a band that is in the military or something. And so it's kind of like a dual story of, Hazel and James and Colette and Aubrey and their love story throughout all of it. While also cutting back sometimes to Aphrodite and Hephaestus and Ares. It is a really good story. Um, It's not too long. It's not too short. Mm -hmm. They go through trials, obviously, and overcome it and insecurities of stuff. And it also touches on, like, the racism that... um, African Americans have had to struggle through, especially like with Aubrey. He's trying to serve his country and his own. He gets sent off to Europe to try and help in the war effort. And the people that are trying to hurt him the most and like actually kill him are Americans mm. and all that. But it's really worth reading. Um, I think I would rate it. I get eight infidelities. Eight infidelities. Nice. Out of ten. It's worth reading. It might be one of my favorite books now, and I know I only rated it an eight, but I think I would have to reread it to really decide. Okay. I really like the story. So. I guess I'll talk about this book really briefly because um, Micah doesn't want me to talk too much about it. And also, I don't really want to talk too much about it because I'm going to just, I'm going to butcher a lot of the points that were made in it. I also just don't want our podcast to be political. This isn't really political. It can be. I guess. Um, Anyway, the the book that I read is called The End of the World is Just the Beginning by Peter Zion. And he is a geopolitical analyst. Um, 
So what that means is his job is to examine how geography, um, actually geopolitical might be the wrong word. His, his job is he examines how geography affects the development of nations and powers throughout history. Um, and this is, this book is basically predicting the end of the global world, the end of the global economy. So right now, we're all very interconnected. China is connected with us. We are connected with China. We are connected with Russia. Russia is connected with us. They're connected with every other country in the world. We're all connected with the Middle East. This is the globalized world as we know it. And this book is giving you the reasons why Peter Zion thinks that this is going to come crashing to an end sometime in the next 10 years, 10, 15 years. Um, and it's very detailed and very interesting. And um, I'm glad I read it because I think this is an important thing to read about. Um, and hopefully this will encourage me to read other books like it. Cause you know, obviously with stuff like this, you, you want to get other opinions um, and expose yourself to other beliefs about what's going on in the world and where the world is going. And you don't want to just pick one person that you like and listen to what they think and just accept what they think is scripture. But I do think that um, he's done a lot of research and presents presents the data in a very compelling way. And, and his predictions are data driven more than anything else emotion or feeling right or yeah intuition he's trying he's trying to use history to predict and trends to predict like what is going to happen in the future um so yeah um this it took me forever to get through this book i don't know why exactly i think at some point it just kind of dragged for me it's very dense right it is dense but like it's pretty much the same length as uh death in florence or the pirate book that i read so it was a little interesting that this is the one that, you know, kind of, it became difficult for me to get through it. Um, but I would say, try it out. It's scary for sure to, to hear some of the predictions that he has. Um, and you're like listening to it and you're like, I hope that's not true. I hope that doesn't happen. But again, I, I think it's important to um, expose yourself to this stuff sort of these uncomfortable theories and truths. So what would you rate it? I would give this and just because I got tired of it, I think, which isn't really a reflection on the quality of the book, but just my enjoyment of it. I'd probably give this an eight where I would have given it a nine if it flowed a little bit better for me, like those other two books. Um, but I'll give it an eight. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll give it an 8. Hmm. The out real of, ones will know. Out of 10. <laughs> um, or the people that watch the YouTube video, because I'll put a picture of exactly what I'm referencing. <laughs> okay. but, Was that all you wanted to say about it? Yeah, I, I think you should read it. I think people should read it. Me or the... Just anyone. Everyone listening. Like, Because this sort of thing, if it's true and if it happens, it's going to affect everybody. Yeah. So... Okay, so coming up this week, we are either watching, coming up for next week's episode, we're either watching La La Land or 500 Days of Summer. I have to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. look at our calendar, but it's one of those is yeah. the next one. And if it's... Watch both of them. Yeah. Spoiler and alert. The next couple of weeks, that's what we're going to be talking about, I think. We have, um, we've both seen those movies before. Spoiler alert. We like them, <laughs> but read, um, but, but watch both of them. Yeah. So you can follow along. Happy Valentine's week, everybody. Yeah. And, um, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. Braden released another special bonus episode for a video game that he played. I think he mentioned uh -huh. it on an episode. No, I'll, that I'll talk about it. that. I'll talk about that next week. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's good. It's good, but also check out our socials, um, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, at This Is Revealable. You know, follow us, subscribe to our channel. We appreciate you all. Bye.